Glad you decided to worship with us this Sunday morning. We're beginning a new series that we've called Tis the Season. Tis the Season. For me, the season, the holiday season began the day after Halloween. Now, it's, it's, it's now Christmas time. How many of you with me? Who loves Christmas here? Christmas, yeah. Where are the Grinches? I hear you, I hear you. How many of you are like, just let Halloween breathe, man? Why can't you just honor Thanksgiving, man? Come on. I'm watching Christmas already, all the Christmas videos. We rewatch them 100 times. It's fantastic. I love this time of year. It's a great time of year, man. Everyone seems to be a little bit nicer. Some people, at least. A little bit nicer, a little bit happier, a little bit more generous. It's just, it's just a great time of the year, man. I, there's a lot of family involved and family gatherings, a lot of food involved. Green bean casserole, come on, my favorite dish. You know you got your favorite dish, and so that's always great, man. It's, but even in the, in, in the middle of what's supposed to be the, like, the season of like, peace on earth and joy and goodwill to all men and stuff, it's really easy to get distracted, to find just the, maybe by the trippings and trimmings of the world to, to get our hearts shifted away from really what the season is all about. And those things can rob our joy, rob our peace. And that's what I kind of want to talk to you about. Uh, before I do that, let me just give you this quick little announcement and a reminder for you to pray about this upcoming special service that we have. And we're just kind of keeping this on your radar so you can pray. Our Heart for the House offering is coming up on Sunday, December 2nd. It's the first Sunday of December. It always is. If you're new to Discovery, this is kind of our end of year um, offering that we use. This entire Sunday's offering goes to our missions Focus, And we dedicate 100% of it to that, to our, our mission focus here at Discovery. We call it a heart for the house. It comes from a Psalm of David that says, zeal for your house burns in me like a fire. And so we're passionate about the things of God. We're passionate about his kingdom and advancing his kingdom and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're, we're, we're passionate about doing this. We take one whole Sunday and we just pray about it. And we lead up to it with prayer and we ask God, what would he have us do above and beyond our tithe to bring a sacrificial gift to really advance those areas of missions at, at Discovery Church? So be in prayer for that. Um, we'll talk more about it in the coming weeks and definitely on, on that Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so tis the season. It is the season. It's a great season. I love it. But it, it can be hard for a lot of people because uh, maybe I want it to be, a lot of people, they want it to be happy and healthy and great. But the reality is it's not always happy, healthy, and great. In fact, even in my own family, I don't know when it was the last time we had all the family together to celebrate the holidays. There's schisms and chasms, and maybe you can relate to that, where it's like, you know, she's not going to come and, and, uh, to Thanksgiving this year. No, they're not going to go over here. And, and so it creates this dissonance and dissatisfaction in, in, in our hearts already. Hey, or, or maybe you, you want to get certain things, some stuff for you or for your kids, and other people are getting those things, and now you feel like you can't get those things. And so check it out. I want to give you, this is going to be a short two-week series, you guys, and then in, in December, we're going to start a series about anxiety and depression and really tackle that big topic. Um, but just short two-week series, I want to give you the mindset, really the mindset and some tools to help you this season that no matter who comes or who doesn't come, who invites you or doesn't invite you, what you're able to get or not get or get, no, no, doesn't matter, any of that stuff, that this season you can experience joy, peace, and triumph. It has nothing to do with all those things if you learn a few secrets. And I want to go over with you today, and they're huge, they're huge. This first one's going to be a really big countercultural secret, you guys, but um, I think it's, it's huge. We're going to be talking about the stuff test the stuff test, and really learning the secret of contentment. And I'll talk to you about that. Let me open it up here with Luke chapter 12. Jesus uh, here speaking, he says, Luke chapter 12, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I mean, so the older brother usually, the older brother would get the inheritance. So this is obviously a younger brother. And he's saying, hey, I want some stuff too. Right? Where's my stuff? Why is it? It's not fair. He gets all the stuff. I like the stuff. Give me some stuff. Tell him to give me some stuff. Jesus replied, man, I don't know if you read the Bible like me, but I, when I read the Bible, I have fun with the Bible. The Bible's funny to me when you think, I see Jesus like, man, what, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you and your brother? Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And I want to talk to you about that today, that, that we need to have some type of boundary, some guards 
against this thing called greed. We live in a very materialistic, consumer-driven culture. About this time of the year, if you haven't already, your mailboxes is fluttered with advertisements or your inbox, your email inbox is fluttered with things that they're telling you you need. There's stuff you don't have, and this stuff is what you need. This is the good stuff, okay? So we need to guard against all kinds of greed because life does not consist in the abundance of things in your house. Life does not consist in the abundance of things in your garage. Life does not consist in the abundance of your stuff. It doesn't consist, he says. And he told them this parable. He told them a little story to kind of, kind of break it down for him. He says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store on my crops. So there was, he was just experiencing huge increase, lots of harvest, which is great. That's good. Good for him. Then he said, this is what I'll say to myself. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and they'll, there I will store my surplus grain. Now, I want you to notice up to this point, this man has done nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with what he's done. There's nothing wrong with experiencing a harvest and having a harvest. This guy, this guy was experiencing an increase. God is not mad that you have a harvest and you have increase. He's not even mad that you had so much of it, you had to build new barns and put new, put them in. That's okay. Have your savings account. Have your 401k. That's fine. That's, the stuff is not the problem. Check it out. He goes, and then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, make it all about you in this next season of life. You just, it's all about you. This is your time now. You've done the work. Now it's about you. But God said to him, you are a fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. In other words, there's no problem with storing up things for yourselves, you guys. You, you have that stuff. It's not that, the stuff isn't the problem. It's your thoughts towards your stuff. It's your heart towards the stuff. So in this season, you guys, filled with materialism and consumerism, how do we pass the stuff test? I want to teach you how, because if you're going to have a season that is peace-loving and joyful and triumphant and all these things, you're going to have to pass the stuff test this year. You're going to have to, and you're going to have to learn the secret of contentment. I want to unpack this today. Let me give you three truths about stuff in order for you to pass the stuff test. Write some notes with me. Check it out right up here on the screen. Here's number one. In order to pass the stuff test, check it out. Number one, you need to know that stuff is just stuff, okay? Stuff, that's all it is. That's all it is. It's just stuff. And we, humanity, are in the business of gathering stuff. <laughs> it's in our nature. We gather stuff. And actually, listen, um, God actually put the desire to acquire inside of every one of you. He did that. Okay, God put the desire to, acqui to acquire nuts inside of squirrels. And so they go and they go acquire nuts, okay? God put the desire to acquire straw into birds. And they go and they get the straw and they build their nests. And so God put all these magnificent and fascinating and beautiful things on the earth. And he put the desire to acquire great things inside of us. See, it's not the desire to acquire, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. It was, there was nothing wrong with this guy having a lot of grain and so much harvest of grain that he had to build new barns. There's, stuff is, is just stuff. It's my heart towards the stuff that is the matter. So the desire to acquire God put there, listen, but it's the uncontrolled desire to acquire that gets you into trouble. It's the uncontrolled, uncontained desire for stuff to acquire is what the Bible calls coveting. In our language today, terminology today, that would be materialism. It's the uncontrolled desire to acquire, but stuff itself is just stuff. Proverbs chapter three, verse nine and 10 says this. It says, honor the Lord with your stuff. Okay, can, that's the question. Can I honor, how do I honor God with this harvest that he's given me? How do I honor God with this stuff? How do I honor God with these possessions? And with the first fruits of your increase, honor God. So basically tithe. He's saying tithe. Bring it to the storehouse. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Jesus says a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Yet we look at someone's life. We look at someone's life, and we equate God's blessings on them based on how much stuff they have or don't have, don't we? 
That's what our minds go to. Oh, look, that person's got a lot of stuff. They must be blessed by God. And they don't have a lot of stuff. So God's blessing isn't on them. Okay, stuff is just, okay, I was talking to a business owner um, last year. It was in this time of, of Christmas season, and, and uh, they, they marketed well. They had some advertisement, and they, they sold so much money on one day of the year. This guy was driving home from, from work, a long day, and he was worshiping God. He, was, he, said, he was telling me, thank you, God, you're so awesome. God, you're so awesome. You're so good. He said, I made more today on this one day than any other day in my entire life. It was a big day for him. He was like, man, this was, this wasn't, if you're a business owner, you know, there's like, you have those days. Wow. I hit a, I hit a new threshold today. And he was saying, God, you're so awesome. And he said in the, in that car, as he was praising God for his awesomeness, he heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit into his heart and told him, what makes you think my awesomeness has anything to do with your business succeeding or not? Whether your business makes money or not, I'm still awesome. And it, it changed his paradigm, he said. And this is amazing. It just, it just shifted him. He said, he said, because what am I going to do in the season of drought? Mo, what am I going to do when it's not going as well? Am I going to think now that the hand of God has been removed from me? And God's blessing is not on me. And his presence is not with me. Listen, stuff is just, you guys are real smart, man. You guys, I knew you could get it. Stuff is just stuff. All right, that's number one, the stuff test. That, just trying to help you pass. If you want to have this season, really be triumphant. You want peace and joy and happiness and all this stuff that doesn't have anything to do with really the stuff or even the people or what you're getting or not getting, you got to pass the stuff test. Stuff is just stuff. And then number two, here, stuff is really just a test. Stuff is a test. See, God will give you stuff to see how you act with the stuff. Some people get some new stuff and they change. <laughs> they get some better stuff and it cha they change. God, See, God will give you some stuff and then he wants to see what your heart is to the stuff that he gave you, what your mind and thoughts are to the stuff he has given you, what he has provided for you. Will you, he wants to see, will you steward his stuff well? Will you be a steward of the stuff? Because, or or will, you, will you get all high and mighty? Deuteronomy chapter 8. Will, you, will the stuff change you? Will you say something like this? Deuteronomy chapter 8. You will say to yourself, oh, my power. I did this. The strength of my hands. I built this business. I got this degree. I was a success. I did it by my hands. I produced this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for actually it's he. He's giving you the ability to be success, to produce that wealth. To do. He's giving you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to you, to your ancestors, as it is today. Stuff is just a test. And you know that God is not only concerned about how you think about the stuff he gives you, but check this out. He's also concerned about the way that you think about the stuff he gives other people. So what are your thoughts about other people's stuff? He cares about that, you know? That actually makes God's top 10 list. You know God's top 10 list, the 10 commandments? Deuteronomy chapter 5, Exodus chapter 20, the 10 commandments. That's God's top 10. This here, how you think about other people's stuff makes it in the top 10. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let me show it to you. It says it up here, Deuteronomy 5. He says, you shall not covet, I'll come back to that word, covet your neighbor's wife. And you say, well, I haven't done that. I'm okay with that. But hold on, all within the same, with the same context of this, of this command of the top 10. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land. Oh, they got a good house. They're on the right side. Oh, I wish I had that third, third car garage. His male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs, any of his stuff. You shall not set your heart on anything that's not yours. Now, the, the Greek word for, for covet, let me give you the Greek word for it, because I know when you, you guys love it when I teach you Greek. Okay, the Greek word is upi thumio. Upi thumio, amen, amen. That's the Greek word for covet, okay? Now, check this out. Upi thumia, you see the difference there? Just a short difference is the Greek word for lust. You see, coveting is lust. And let me tell you what, what the, the similar, like where they're both combined, the upi thumi part, it means to set your heart on. 
to set your heart on, to set your heart on something that is not yours. That's what coveting means. That's what lust means. See, now let me tell you why it bothers God so much. Because something else has, has your heart. Something else has your heart, the place, the focus that was reserved for God. You have shifted focus, heart, attention. Something else has your heart. See, the problem with greed is that it looks to people to meet my needs. Listen, and as long as you keep looking to people to meet your needs, you'll always be disappointed in your life because people will never be able to meet your needs. They will never be. Stuff is simply a test where God, where God gives provision to see how we treat the provision and what our thoughts are toward the provision. Because we think having more stuff will make me more happy. Having more stuff will mean more security. Having more stuff will mean more importance. Having more stuff will mean more love. And it's not true. It's just simply, you guys, not true. Stuff is just stuff. And stuff is just a test. I'm trying to help you pass the stuff test right before Black Friday. Come on now, somebody. <laughs> um, Romans chapter 12 says, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, there's the, in our materialism, consumerism is our culture, and I got nothing wrong with stuff. Go ahead. Harvest. Come on. It's the, you got the desire to acquire. That's okay. It's how you think about that stuff. It's what your heart is towards that stuff, you guys. That's, that's, that's the issue here. And instead of just fitting in with culture and doing what culture does, maybe you should find a different current called the kingdom of God and live a kingdom culture that is different from the culture of the world. Then he says, you'll only be, only then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. I'm trying to help you pass the stuff test, man. Uh, so you just develop a mindset, develop some skills that can, that can really, truly give you peace, give you joy. It's really what you're looking for. You're just trying to find it in stuff, okay? Stuff is just stuff. Stuff's just a test. And number three, write this down. Contentment is passing the stuff test. Contentment is passing the stuff test. Man, it's hard to be contentment nowadays. Content nowadays, it really is. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's more stuff. It, I thought it was hard even when I was a kid. I, it, around this time, Thanksgiving, every every year we'd celebrate as a, as a family, and we would all say what we're thankful for. We actually continue the tradition now. We still, tradition, and we still do that with our kids. Our kids hate it. We make them say what they're thankful for, and 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 then we tell like what they're thankful for for each other and stuff. And and it's just something we want to sow inside of them this this gratitude and and have them express this. And we do this on on Thanksgiving all together, and it's special. But we did it when we were a kid, and my grandpa was that grandpa. He was that grandpa. He was, he was, this guy was so ornery. He would call everybody George. He knew your name. He knew my friend's name that came over. I even read girls over, and it's a George. I mean, this guy was, this guy was ornery, man. And so we would be saying what we're thankful for, and, and kids, we're thankful for stuff. And we're, like, and we're calling out stuff. And he would get so mad. He was, he, he was the grandpa, like some, maybe some of your grandpas, because he would, he would every Thanksgiving tell the story. I had to walk to school. You guys don't even know. I walked to school in the snow, uphill, both ways. You had the same grandpa, man. They went to the same school. That's what happened. He would tell us, and he gets so mad at us. And like, come on, Grandpa, man. I just can't imagine what, how, like, you know, our grandkids are going to be living content and grateful. I don't know what it's going to, the story is going to change. We used to drive Beamers when we are you know, and you guys in your jetpacks these days. I don't know what it's going to be like, but even today, it's hard. It's hard to be content because now you got social media. And, and, and you flip open your social media deal and, and it, cause it makes you feel like you're missing out on something when really you're just missing out on the moment you're in. Okay. So, so, so I, I'm not content with the family I have, with the children I have, with the wife I have, with the home I have, with the season of life that I'm in, that because of this portal, I've actually, now I'm looking at somebody else's stuff, somebody else's moment, somebody else's season, and now I want, I want that. And I've become discontent. My heart has shifted. My focus has shifted. Proverbs 14 and 30 says, it is healthy to be content. Like it's, it's good for you. 
I mean, it's good for your health, for your physical health, your emotional health, the longevity of, longevity of life. It is healthy to be content, but that envy will kill you. It literally will eat you up inside. And you, you can't fall prey to the comparison trap and live content at the same time. You can't. You can't be content while you're comparing other people's stuff and season because no matter how much stuff you have and how much stuff you acquire, you'll never have the most or you'll never have enough. That's the problem with stuff. Solomon discovered a better way. Solomon was, was a king of, of Israel. He wrote, two, he wrote the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the wisdom literature of your Old Testament. And he was wealthy, and he tried to fill the holes in his life with his wealth and stuff, and he couldn't. And he realized how big a deal contentment was. Ecclesiastes 6 and 9 says this. It is better to be satisfied with the moment you're in right now. It's better to be satisfied with your, with your salary right now. It's better to be satisfied with the size of your living room right now than to always be wanting something else. He said, man, I've just been chasing the wind, he says. But there's a secret to contentment that I want to share with you this morning because you got, in order for you to enjoy this season, I want you to enjoy this season. I want this season to be different maybe than a lot of your previous seasons. Another Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6, it says, better is one handful with, and I love this word tranquility. It means peace of heart and mind. How many does that sound good this season, to have peace of heart and mind, like no matter what is going on in society, economy, family, stuff, better is one handful with tranquility than what you do on Thanksgiving. You go two handfuls off, you know, you two plate in it, some of you, you know what I mean? Two plate, nah, it's better, just one plate that thing, man, it'll be there, it'll be there, than a toil in chasing after the wind. The Apostle Paul teaches us what it means to be content. And I want to kind of study this with you guys. Philippians chapter 4, um, verses 11 through 13. He says this. He says, I am not saying this because I'm in need. For I have, check this out. He says, I have learned to be content. I mean, I wasn't born this way. I mean, I'm a kind of old in age now, but I've learned to be content because I was actually born with this desire to acquire. God put it there, but then because of my sin nature, it's uncontrolled desire, and I like stuff, and I want stuff, and I want it all the time, but I've learned to be content because contentment is not a disposition you're born with. It's a decision you make. I've learned it, Paul says. I've learned to be content in whatever the circumstances that my situation does not dictate my satisfaction. Whatever the circumstances. Are you catching this today, you guys? My situation does not determine my satisfaction. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to, be, uh, to have plenty. I know what it is to drive a Hyundai. And I know what it is to drive a Tesla, he says. I know. I've been there. I've, I've done it. I have learned, he said. Continue. I've learned the secret of being content, Paul says, in every situation. Wi-Fi, no Wi-Fi, shipwrecked, poison, whatever it is, in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether he says living in plenty or in want, because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And a lot of you know that verse, Philippians chapter 4, 13. One translation says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, and that applies to a lot of areas of our life. Yes, he can. He'll give it. He can do all things. But, but what I'd like for you to realize today is in context to what Paul is saying, Paul's actually saying in order to live this way, to live this countercultural way in a materialistic, consumer-driven culture, man, I've learned. I wasn't born this way. I didn't always have it. I kind of wanted to acquire too much, but I learned the secret of being content, and it was the power of Christ that enabled me to do it. You're going to need this power, I'm telling you, to live counterculturally, to be in the world and not of the world. But, but let's just admit it, okay? When I, when I said contentment, a lot of you had this radio dial in your brain. You just shut it off, man, because you're like, I don't want none of that, okay? Because contentment to you, because contentment to you is, has more to do with not achieving 
has more to do with maybe laziness and, and not, not, not being a success in these things. Like, because like, you, want, you want maybe a little bit of discontent, right? Because you want to you wanna be a success. You want to do successful things. You want to achieve some goals. And maybe you want to keep driving forward and make a difference in this world. So we got to, listen, we got to redefine contentment. We do. Because what I'm talking about contentment, what you're thinking probably about contentment is different. And what the Bible says contentment is, is very different from what a lot of people think contentment is. So check it out. Contentment is not settling for less. It's not. That's not what contentment is. Contentment isn't settling. It's not the laziness. It's not a lack of drive. It's not settling for less. It's not just being okay. It's not, oh, whatever happens, whatever happens is going to happen. That's not contentment. Remember who wrote this? This was the Apostle Paul who wrote this, one of the greatest figures of human history who probably accomplished more than 100 people could accomplish. He he was a builder, a driver. He changed history. This is the guy who said, I press on toward to reach the goal of which I am called. This is the guy who said, I keep fighting the good fight. This is the guy who kept saying, I'm going to race. I'm going to keep boxing. This was a guy who said, I learned to be content. I learned it. I learned to be content. Content. Look, and he was, Paul was not a settler. Paul was not a settler at all. You know what contentment is? Back it up. You cheated. Back it up. (laughs) Contentment. Contentment is being able to build. Back it up. (laughs) Contentment is being able to build your business and keep your family. See, because some of you can build a great business, but because you're so anxious and frustrated and discontent, you, you lose your family. You sacrifice the greater things for the lesser things. See, that's you, contentment enables you to be a success and achieve success and not lose your life in the process and not lose your health in the process. Because some people can be a great success and achieve great results, but they, they do it with so much anxiety and stress that, that they actually shave years off their life. And, and I, I'm, what could God do with just those 10, 15, 20 more years that you shaved off your life because you were so discontent? You see, contentment will allow you to, to, to drive toward reaching great goals without driving yourself or your family crazy. Okay. Amen. Does that sound good? Okay. That's what contentment is. Now you can go to a biblical definition of contentment. A biblical definition of contentment is this. Contentment is setting your heart on God. That's what contentment is setting our hearts. You may want to write in if you're taking the note. Setting our heart on God in every situation. Because so, you know, some of us can set our heart on God in times of plenty, but when you get times in want, your heart starts to shift. It's, it's, it, that's, see, contentment is just a heart position. It's, it's what you're feeling and your heart towards things and your heart towards God and your thoughts towards them. And even, to be honest, contentment is the only way for us to experience the exceedingly abundant life that God has called us to. See, what contentment does, it, it sets our heart on God. It puts our trust in God. It says, in my hands, I can, I can build it, but in your hands, God, you can build it better. See, it was in my mind, in my strength, in my ability, I can do it. But as I trust in you and I put my heart and I put it in your hands, I know that I'll get your ways and your results. And you said you can do exceedingly abundantly above that which I can ask or imagine. You see, some of us, the, what's preventing that exceeding, that abundant life is this word right here, contentment. And you think, you got the wrong definition. You think that, if, that, that you need to live with some discontentment. And that, you need, that, that contentment is an enemy. No, no, no. Contentment is a heart disposition that sets itself on God. A heart towards God. Paul says, I've learned the secret to be content. I passed the stuff test, and I want to help you guys out. Learn the secret of contentment today so that this season you can have joy, you can have triumph, you can have peace. And again, it does not matter what the world is doing for you or not for you or people are doing for you or not for you, what you can or can't get or give, okay? Here it is. The secret of contentment. It's got to start right here. You have to realize. Realize what we have. Realize what we have. We all have have wants and needs and desires. We all have a list. 
Some of you, it's a mental list. Some of you actually have a physical list. My kids make a physical list every year. You know, I enjoy tearing it up in front of them. No, I'm kidding. I'm not that, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. But they do. They make the list. They do that. All of us have our lists. And, we, and, and many of them, check it out, many of them are legitimate. They're legitimate. And we could probably have a pity party together if we all talked about our list of stuff. We probably could, okay? But do you realize what you do have? Do you realize who you do have? Okay, and I know this time of the year is hard because some of you don't have some people that you used to have, and that makes it hard. I get it. But if you're gonna, if you're gonna learn, I'm not minimalizing that. It, I understand the hurts that, that, that some of you are, are going through. If you are gonna learn the secret of contentment, though, you can't focus on what you don't have anymore. You need to focus on what you do have and who you have. And you know who you have? You have the King of Glory. You have King Jesus. You, you, have, you are an heir with Christ, a joint heir. You are seated with him in heavenly places. He is for you, not against you. You need to realize what and who you have in order to learn the secret of contentment. First Timothy chapter 1, Paul writing to a young leader in the church, a young man, Timothy, he says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom, Paul says, I know where I came from. I know what I have. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not going to forget it. I know who I used to be. I mean, you might not know who Pastor Jason used to be. You know, a little bit. I told you some stories, but I know who I used to be, and I, I, I know who I have now and who I am now. I was the worst, Paul says. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Man, I know what I have. I have eternal life. And then Paul gets into a praise break here. He's like, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And the church said... So yes, we're broken vessels. Yes, we have needs. Yes, we have wants. Yes, we have failures. But instead of focusing on the things we lack or the things we don't have, what if we focus on the things that we do have? What if we focus on the things, the people that we do have? See, don't spend your life, church, chasing success. Stop spending your life chasing money, chasing glory, okay? Chase the king of glory. All right, check this out. Listen, we get, the king gets the glory, and we get the king. Because so, to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, to him alone, he gets the glory. To him alone deserves the, the honor forever and ever. He gets the glory, we get the king, and I'm okay with that. Amen, somebody? Amen. You need to realize what you have. And honestly, you have a lot more than you think you have. You absolutely do. If he stopped alone at saving your soul and giving you a deposit as a seal of the promise of the hope that we have of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, sanctifying us, if he stopped there, you had enough to thank God the rest of your life. But he said, I've made you rich in every way so that you could be generous on every occasion. Some of you, the problem is you don't know how rich you are. All you can see is how rich you're not. Okay, you, you just don't know that you, God has made you rich. Paul, again, tells Timothy later on in that chapter, in chapter 6, he says this, Command those, Timothy, who are rich in this present world, and you're going to find out that's you, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in that wealth. Why? Because it's so uncertain. But to put your hope. Hey, don't, don't, don't shift your heart. Don't shift your mind. Put your heart in the right place. Put your hope in God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. If I were to ask you this question, go ahead and you can answer it. Who here is rich in Christ because of the King of glory lives in you? Who here would say that? Are you rich in Christ? Amen. How many of you are, are look at this, who richly, he, there's nothing wrong with you having stuff. He says he provides you that stuff for your enjoyment. It's not that you have stuff, it's your heart towards the stuff. That's the problem. How many of you here have been rich with stuff? So you know, I got a lot of stuff and I'm rich. I'm rich. I got a lot of stuff. I'm wealthy. See, not a lot of people actually say that. You're, you're hesitant to say that. But in America, you need to know this. In America, you are already rich because you have Jesus. But now you're in America, okay? You are, it, they did this study that said if you make $37,000 a year in annual household income, you're in the top 4% richest in the world. 
And looky here, you think you're not rich. <laughs> Top 4%, okay? They, they did a Gallup poll um, of all Americans, and they asked Americans, how much do you have to make to be considered rich? And they said this. They said, well, you got to make $150,000. To which some of you are like, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right, because I'm not making that much. I'd like that much. That sounds like it's, that's rich, you know? Okay, but they asked, they then asked those who make thirty to $35,000, Americans who make thirty, and they said, well, rich is actually if you make $75,000. That's what rich is, to which some of you, you're kind of giggling at that. You're like, that's not rich, man. You know why? Because I'm that, and I'm not rich. <laughs> not rich. Okay, so you see the, the pattern here. They, then they asked the, uh, the people who subscribe to Money Magazine, which you... I guess you got to make a lot of money to subscribe to. People who subscribe to it make a lot of money. I don't subscribe to it, but they did ask the Money Magazine people, how much in assets and liquid assets do you need to have in order to be considered rich? You know what they said? They said, you got to have $5 million. That's what rich is. To which a lot of you are like, yeah, that's stinking rich. That's rich right there. There it is. No, because check it out. If you ask these people who have this much, are you rich and what does it mean to be rich? They wouldn't consider themselves rich. Okay, so here's the bottom line. Nobody is rich, but everybody knows someone who is. <laughs> okay? So you don't know. The problem is, here, here's the secret. Here's the secret of contentment. You don't know how rich you are. Therefore, you're not handling your wealth right. You're not stewarding your richness. You have been made rich, and you don't even know it. Therefore, you're not stewarding. you got to realize, church, what and who you have if you want to pass the stuff test and learn the secret of contentment. All right, here's the second thing. The second, in order to see the, the secret of contentment, not only do you got to, you got to recognize that church, realize what we have. Number two, you got to make God your source. Make God your source. Because at the end of the day, check it out. Discontentment is not about the stuff. It's about trying to fill the void. That's what discontentment is really about. I'm filling the void with stuff because my heart has shifted from God to things. It's the oopy the me uh, part. We've set our hearts on the wrong things, on the wrong stuff. So what is your source? What are you working for? Who do you work for? Do you work for money or does money work for you? Listen, don't, co don't confuse the resources with the source. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either you're going to hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You see, money makes a good servant, but it makes a terrible master. See, when you make God your source and you recognize him daily, I'm telling you, you will, you will strive to better that relationship daily. And when you better that relationship daily, you won't need the stuff that the world tries to throw at you telling you what you need because you already know. And if you want to live a wealthy life, it's not going to be because you had a lot of stuff. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. He says, yet true godliness with contentment in itself, you're rich. You got great wealth. Look, contentment is wealth. Are you hearing me, church? That's, contentment is richness. And if you don't, and if you, you don't agree with that, then you've never been hungry before. Then you've never been thirsty. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the woman at the well, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Hey, you keep chasing after stuff, you'll need more stuff. You keep filling your heart with that stuff, that stuff will never satisfy you. It won't make you more important. It won't, won't satisfy you forever. It won't make you more happy. It won't make you more valuable. You will always go back to that well again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, he says, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, when God is your source, your reward isn't the stuff. It's the satisfaction. It's the, it's the wellspring of eternal life. Make God your source. You, wanna, you want to know the secret of contentment. We got to pass the stuff test that this season gonna be, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. It doesn't matter what's, what's out there. What matters is what's in here, okay? I need to make God my source, my satisfaction. Here's the third thing, the secret of contentment that we need to have. We got to live our life on mission. Live our life 
on mission. We've been using Paul a lot today. Let's look again in his letter to the church at Philippi because um, you got to put something in your life bigger than the stuff that's pulling your heart. You got to have a mission and a goal and a purpose in life that is greater than the stuff that's getting your attention. Okay? Paul here, Philippians chapter 3, says this Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. He was driven, he's a driven guy. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He says, Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have yet taken hold of it, but. This one thing I do. See, Paul had like, he narrowed down his mission to a, a one thing. And every single one of you, if you want to pass the stuff test, if you want to learn the secret of contentment, you got to get a one thing. You got to get some mission, some purpose in your life. That this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on, he says, toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. See, Paul understood what it meant to live on mission. The wealthiest people on earth, you know what? It's not the people who have the most stuff. It's the people who have the most purpose. They are the wealthiest people on earth. And Paul understood the kind of fulfillment of doing God's work and building God's kingdom would be. So much so that no matter where he went or what he accomplished, he had this mindset. I haven't arrived yet. I'm still pressing on. There's still more. As long as there is breath in me, as long as there is energy in me, as long as God, you're giving me the resources and the tools, I'm going to press on to reach the prize. That one goal, I'm going to forget what is behind me. I'm pressing ahead while there is still is breath in my lungs, yet still I will serve you. See, your, your mission in life is, is not the acquisition of stuff. <laughs> your, your purpose in life is to complete your mission. The assignment that God has given you mission perpetuates provision when you see when you get a goal for living when you have a mission for living god will start he'll give the provision to accomplish the mission come on let's not i've went too long let's bow our heads and close our eyes you guys and i just want to spend some time in prayer with you right where you're seated i know this is this is a countercultural message and some of you that came in today you had the wrong definition of contentment Maybe you have just kind of fit in with culture just a little bit too much, the flow of culture. And as the stuff is not wrong and the desire to acquire and having nice things, none of that is wrong at all. It's, it's the heart towards and the thoughts towards those things. And maybe today you realize my heart is off. It's, it's I put it on the wrong things. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a mission for living. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for some of you, you need to do that probably for the first time, to trust your life, to put your heart, set your heart on on God. Some of you need to do that for the first time. That's called salvation, to just give him your heart, give him your entire life, surrender the control. Some of you need to do it again because your heart has shifted. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. I'd love to pray for you right where you're seated to just have a heart shift today to put Jesus at the the first place, the priority place of your heart and life. Really, that's what salvation is. It's shifting the priorities of our life to say, you are King Jesus. You are in charge. You're in control. You are Lord. So with every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, whether it's the first time or you need to do it again, you need to reprioritize today. I'm not going to have you come up to the front. You're not going to stand up. I just want to pray for you right where you're seated so God can do a new work in your life, give you a fresh start today. If that's you, with every head bowed and eye closed, do me a favor and lift up your hand and lift it high so I can see it. Say, I want a fresh start. I want to shift my heart. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Praise God. Amen. 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 Amen over there. Yep. Yeah, over there. Yep. Here, 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 here. Here, leave it up. Yes. Amen, young man. Good job. Good job, buddy. Amen. Amen. Awesome. But put your hands down. If I miss you, God sees you. You can just whisper something like this. Just say, Jesus, and say his name. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life. I reprioritize my life. You're first. I want to live for you from this day forward. Come live inside of me. Change my heart. Change my desires. Change my mind. Thank you, Jesus, for 
saving me, for setting me free. God, I pray for your church, every person in this room, that we would pass the stuff test this year. That amidst all the ads and consumerism and materialism, that we would find a different current flowing, a kingdom current that would help us to live above it, to be in the world and not of the world, to set our hearts on you, Jesus. Will you get the glory from everything in our life, God? You get the glory of everything in our life, God. It's all yours. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for giving us the ability to produce wealth, but it's yours, God. So we surrender it to you. We surrender our pursuits to you, our life to you, that, God, we can build that business and not lose our family with contentment. We can, we can be successful. We can have the drive, but not in my hands. God, I don't want to drive it anymore. I surrender the control. It's yours, God, in your hands. It's better in your hands than in mine. So, God, I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, church.